great. Okay, so we're at the mark. Uh, let's get started and get ready. So I first want to say thank you everyone for coming and joining us today. We've got some awesome guests here, Cindy and Yusuf. Um, I just wanted to start off with Please feel free to have your camera on or unmute if you have a specific question and you really want it to be answered right away. We want to make this very coffee chat style. Um, also, please feel free to add any questions in the Q&A in the chat. Uh, we can either answer them right away during the conversation or also at the end. Um, I love to make this really interactive and engagement. We're here for community engagement, right? So please feel free to also engage with an emoji. If we want to do some claps, we can do that too. But yeah, I'd love to see a little bit of that. Um, I first wanted to set the tone a little bit. I know a lot of you know why you're here attending today, mainly for communications and community engagement, but I think it would be good to kind of set the tone and set the story here. So first I wanna, I want everyone to picture this. You know, you've spent hours putting together surveys, reports, and informational materials for your next project, and you're ready to engage with your community. You launch the project and crickets. Only 15 people provide input, and honestly, 10 of whom you hear from regularly. Um, so what might have happened? The meticulous work you've done feels, well, really great spent. This is where the importance of implementing a strong communications plan alongside your engagement work comes into play. So we have wonderful Cindy and Yusuf here. We'll do a quick um, intro to them. So if we can start the slides. I'll have a few more people coming in. I'm going to give a warm, warm welcome to Natalie, my awesome tech in the background. Perfect. Okay. So if you just came in, we did a little bit of where everyone's coming from, but we're just getting started. So welcome, welcome. I see a few more people coming in and we're going to do a quick intro of our panel today. So let's start off with Yusuf. So as the Secretary of Communications and Public Engagement for the St. Louis Board of Aldermen, Yusuf is the mastermind behind the scenes, weaving together his background in startups, workforce management excellence, brand development, and strategic planning, both in private and public sectors. Yusuf, leading the communication strategy in St. Louis's participatory budgeting project for the RAM Settlement Funds. With $280 million at stake, he's ensuring that every community member has a say in how their city grows and flourishes. Whether he's crafting compelling narratives, building bridges between diverse stakeholders, or charting the course for a brighter future, Yusuf is the embodiment of innovation and inclusion in action. So let's give a warm welcome to Yusuf as we embark on a journey through the heart of St. Louis, where his passion and expertise converge to create a more vibrant and equitable community for all. So let's welcome Yusuf to our digital stage. We can do some emojis, et cetera. Hey. So you, <laughs> yay, I love that. Um, so Yusuf, quickly, um, let's go over his fun fact. I thought this was really cool. We love to ease it up a bit and get a little casual. So Yusuf's fun fact is he's an avid rock climber. And uh, he even wrote and published a guidebook to Jackson Falls, a popular climbing area in Southern Illinois, um, which is pretty cool. I've known Yusuf for like half a year now, and I didn't even know that about you. So that's pretty cool. Um, Yusuf, if you'd like, you could add the link to the chat. So if anyone's curious. Um, and then Yusuf, I'll start with asking you just a few icebreaker questions. So Yusuf, what's your favorite part about working in community engagement? You know, I think... Uh, what I've learned in this process is that people really do want to, you know, provide input. They really do want their voices to be heard. They just need an outlet for that. Um, and so that's been exciting. I think a lot of times at the local level, we think people are disengaged or not interested. Um, but, you know, it, it's been really exciting to see that the opposite is the opposite is true. People really do want to participate. They just need a way that works for them. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing. And um, another icebreaker question, which I think is a little more funny, is Yusuf, what's your least favorite communications local government buzzword? 
Yeah, I think some a word that gets thrown around a lot, especially because I work in the legislative branch of government, is when we talk about um, a bill uh, not making it to the floor or not going to uh, a vote. You know, we kind of everyone has just adopted this phrase that like, you know, the bill is dead. Um, I think that, you know, that's misleading and, and, and not doesn't accurately portray the legislative process, which is iterative. It's something that, um, you know, uh, it's not a linear process. So I think when we use that word, kind of when we reach for it, um, you know, it, it, we're communicating, I, I think we're sending the wrong message to the public. You know, these ideas don't necessarily die. They just go on to inform, uh, you know, future legislation or, you know, so yeah, I just kind of bristle against that word. And, and as much as I can try not to, to use that in my own, <laughs> in my own work. Yeah. I was like, don't mention that around you, Seth. But it's it's <laughs> interesting you say that because I do agree. It should be like a cycle, right? It should be continuous uh -huh. and it doesn't just like stop right there once the idea has been made. So I love that. Uh, let's get to the next slide and we'll do a little bit of an intro for Cindy. Perfect. Thank you. So as a communications manager and public information officer of the city of Hyattsville, Cindy leads engagement and awareness efforts for her city, serving as a crucial leader in fostering connections and raising public consciousness. With a background as vibrant as the city she serves, Cindy brings a blend of experience in community development, fundraising, and governance, both in the nonprofit and governmental spheres. So whether she's penning press releases, rallying the troops for community events, or spinning her magic on social media, Cindy is the driving force behind Hyattsville's spirit of togetherness and progress. Get ready to be inspired as we dive into the world of Hyattsville, where Cindy's passion and professionalism intersect to create something truly extraordinary. Welcome, Cindy, to our virtual stage. Thank you, June. I love all your claps there in the chat love to see that um and then a fun fact about cindy which i think is pretty interesting is uh cindy and all her siblings all have their birthdays in the same week in september that's a pretty cool one <laughs> i'm like who goes first cindy do you guys like all celebrate together how does that work if there is a complicated system <laughs> of <laughs> rotating birthdays <laughs> yeah and your poor parents that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> to dish out all, all in one week, right? But anyways, um, and then Cindy, we'll go over, what's your favorite part about community engagement? I share Yusuf's uh, sentiments there. I think one thing that was uh, really eye-opening for me, transitioning from a nonprofit environment to a local government environment is how much you as a resident have uh, power in your local government environment. It's easy to feel disenfranchised as you go up in government levels. And I think if you wanna feel like you can really make a difference and make a change, uh, starting local is the place to do it. And so I, um, as Yusuf said, I love that we can give multiple opportunities for people to find their way in and find their voice and, and really feel like they can be an advocate for their community. Love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then Cindy, uh, another one is, what is your least favorite communications buzzword? Yeah, I, I don't know that's necessarily a buzzword, but I hate the saying kill two birds with one stone. I feel like we've made it this far in uh, the <laughs> country. We should come together as a communications <laughs> community and come up with something better for meeting that sentiment. I've occasionally gone with hold two birds in one hand and that just doesn't have the same <laughs> ring. So <laughs> we need something else. Communications folks on the on the call here, uh, help us out. <laughs> Oh, I feed two Ooh. birds with one scone. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. Ooh, that feed good. two birds with one seed. Oh, I like yeah. that. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, thank you, everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why we share, right? So thank you, Cindy. Welcome, welcome. And then quickly, we're going to quickly go over myself and Citizen Lab. I'll be moderating today and kind of moving the conversation along. But my name is Andrea Conway. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Citizen Lab. My job is to mainly network and collaborate with organizations that want to implement digital engagement within their organization. I have a really fun background in sports engagement. Um, and then for about six years, I did cannabis engagement and consulting. I'm actually from Toronto, Ontario in Canada. Um, I saw some other Torontonians also come here as well. Um, and then that actually led me to Citizen Lab. Um, I guess a fun fact about me is when I was doing cannabis consulting, I actually got to Yahoo Finance for top 10 business consultants in all of North America. That was pretty cool. Um, and I guess my favorite part of community engagement is actually being able to 
collaborate with organizations that mainly amplify historically underrepresented voices and community members. And um, I guess my ick for communications buzzword is the word synergy. We were talking about it earlier and I'm like, is that even a word? I'm not sure, but sometimes it gets thrown around in like big corporate meetings and I'm like, I hate this word. So anyways, um, let's keep moving forward. Um, and let's go to segment one, which is engagement and communication strategies. So first up, I'd love to engage you guys with a little bit of a poll. So we have a poll. It should show up um, on your screen right now. And essentially, we're asking, what methods have you succeeded when communicating about your projects with your community? So we got some answers here. We have social media, town halls emails to mailing lists, community-based organizations, online community engagement platform, and other. Ooh, we've got three people saying other. Would love to know what that other is, either in the chat or you can unmute as well, if you'd like to share. Great. And let's have the poll. So let's share a little bit of the results. So we have here, I think at a big win is social media. Then we have uh, community-based organizations, very nice emails to mailing list, um, online community engagement platform, really nice, and town halls and other, really great. For those who said other, I'm curious, what was that other? Um, feel free to add it in the chat or even unmute. Would love to just, just curious about what that is. Boots on the ground from Patricia, nice. Love to hear that. Okay, so now let's chat quickly about, um, let's set the scene a little bit and let's talk about engagement and communication strategies. So let's start asking our panel a few questions. So um, how do you guys identify the main objectives for a new community engagement project? Starting you off nice and hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can start. We certainly one of the things is knowing the boundaries of the project. So what is something that can change and what is something that can't? Um, you know, if, if there are, we don't want to collect a lot of community feedback if we're putting together a park and everyone says they want a splash pad, but it's you know fiscally impossible to plumb a splash pad in the park, we want to make sure folks know what are the things they can provide feedback on. Um, I know we'll get to this later in the conversation, but that feedback loop is incredibly important. And if you feel like you're just pouring ideas into a big void, um, it, we start to lose uh, feedback from others. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yusuf? Yeah, something that um, we try to, Something that we think about is, you know, how do we get people involved? What are the ways we can get people involved um, at the beginning of the process and understanding what types of, you know, what types of survey tools are going to be um, useful to people and how are they going to access it? Um, you know, I think starting that process early is is one of the key things to building trust rather than completely designing your uh, your um, your community engagement plan and then kind of releasing it to the public. Um, I think it's better to start with uh, public participation at the outset. So yeah, again, just understanding like, how do they want to participate? How can they participate given their availability and bandwidth? Um, you know, we'll get to it later, but you know, uh, that's one of the reasons we picked, we wanted to use some sort of online engagement tool is we knew that committee hearings are difficult for people to attend. You know, it doesn't always work with their schedules. Um, so how do we design something that works um, with a busy work and family life? Love that, thank you so much. Now let's get a little more strategic. So what strategies have you found most effective in promoting community engagement projects and really just encouraging widespread participation? As people um, said in that poll, yeah, social media always rises to the top for us. <laughs> um, that is, you know, a simple and um, inexpensive way to get a broad reach, particularly if you have 
partners that you can reach out to and make it easy for them to share that communication with their networks. Um, and then here in the city, we're fortunate to have print publications, signage, um, depending on the nature of the project, we'll look at where do we need to get the messaging out and what are the most effective ways to get to those folks? Is it a mailer? Is it uh, doing a, an event in uh, that community? Um, is it just making sure that they know that they have access to this online platform? Um, but certainly social media is a good, easy start. I know a, a bunch of folks in the poll also mentioned email communication list. If you have an email list, um, utilize those big tools at your disposal. Yeah, and something that we've had success with um, is really making sure that we're getting that information out to press. So whether that's uh, print or, uh, you know, radio or, um, you know, TV interviews with uh, with local journalists, uh, that is, is, is a place that we found a lot of success. It's a way to um, to break down something that may seem complicated um, into an understandable and digestible form. Um, and, you know, uh, it's also a way to not necessarily preach to the choir. Um, you know, it's a way to get um, to get your message in front of folks who maybe, um, you know, wouldn't organically come across your social media feed or aren't uh, subscribed to your newsletter. So uh, we've had a, a lot of success uh, doing the things that Cindy had mentioned, but also, um, you know, making sure we partner with uh, with local journalists to get the story out. Right. I love that. So do, doing it you know, with your team, but it also here is like a little bit of like um, adding other community members, et cetera, getting people to repost. So really like diving into kind of like a full team effect and actually talking a little bit about that, Yusuf, uh, you talked a little bit about print, radio, digital, in-person. Um, I'd love to ask the next question, which is, can you guys share any insights on implementing, you know, the, that blend of digital and in-person engagement strategies? So really, how do you measure the success and representativeness of these strategies? And how does that kind of blended engagement look like right now? Yeah, I mean, something that we knew, you know, we're a pretty small team. I'm, I'm sure that other people uh, will share that experience. And so we knew that, you know, as much as we did want to have, you um, you know, a, a, a digital and in-person strategy, we knew we were going to skew more towards an online strategy because it worked, unfortunately, best with our budget um, and mm -hmm. our, our capacity. Um, so knowing that, we just really uh, try to be mindful that, um, you know, uh, any kind of strategy that leans heavily on a digital approach isn't necessarily going to be representative um, of your city's population. So something that we tried to do um, once we started to get uh, data uh, and responses from uh, from participants in our public engagement process, we wanted to make it clear uh, to the folks that are making decisions, the the aldermen here, um, that uh, that the voting participants and the population of St. Louis City are different. So once we got data from our most recent survey, we also included disaggregated data so people could see, um, you know how are people voting uh, within groups? So with, by race, by age, by income. Um, and that way we could really see, um, you know, where people's priorities were. So having that census data and kind of putting that against whatever data that you've collected, I think is key in showing um, showing decision makers that uh, um, that even, even though digital, uh, a, a digital engagement strategy um, is important, it doesn't necessarily reach everybody. Um, uh, so being mindful of that is key. I mean, we did try to do uh, a lot of in-person uh, um, engagement, but we just found that, um, you know, probably the thing that would have been more effective would have been canvassing, which we just as a as a body did not have the the resources or the manpower to to commit to. So that's kind of where we landed. Yeah. And uh We've been fortunate to work with a couple of consultants on some larger infrastructure projects, and uh, they will usually lead the in-person portion of the uh, engagement, but it's been important for us to connect with them so that whatever data they're trying to collect during those in-person sessions, we can replicate it on our online platform. So we're not asking sort of two totally different sets of questions that will be difficult to coalesce into a final result. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, kind of like 
almost also combating like survey fatigue, making sure everyone is being able to still engage but not feel like inundated with all these questions and all this information. I also really like Yusuf that you mentioned kind of knowing that mainly it's going to be digital, but still meeting people where they are. I really like that implementation and kind of, you know, getting different community members and then taking that engagement information and then comparing it with census. I think that's really nice because it's like real data. They can really understand, okay, maybe this community, this neighborhood we're not hearing from, and maybe that's an underrepresented community. So instead of maybe going full digital, maybe that community, we'd have to do some canvassing or community in-person events. So great. I, I really like that. Um, okay, let's move to our next segment, which is challenges and a creative solution. So um, Natalie, can you please come up with our next Zoom poll question, which is going to be, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to communicating with your community? So we have a few options here. We have always hear from the same 10 people. Uh, I feel like that's a, that's a common one when I meet with a lot of organizations. Um, can't reach traditionally underrepresented groups not enough bandwidth to communicate across channels, um, no previous experience with communication strategies, language barriers, and then other. So here we'll wait a little bit just to get some answers. And anyone that clicks other would love, like curious to see what that other is. So feel free to add that to the chat as well. I'll leave a few more seconds for the poll. I'll end it there and then I'll share the results. So really big here is always hearing from the same 10 people. About 75% of us here right now in the webinar definitely are feeling that biggest challenge. Um, and then we have can't reach traditionally underrepresented groups. Yes, um, about 56% of us here feel that. Uh, then we have not enough bandwidth to communicate across channels. Um, and then sometimes even not enough team members, like bandwidth in general, right? So Yusuf and Cindy mentioned it really quickly. You know, they have smaller teams, right? Um, we have here language barriers, yes. And then no previous experience with communication strategies. And then about 16% of you said other. So really interesting there. Um, let's see here. Ooh, okay. We have Sarah saying one of her others is irrelevant responses. STPs, love that, Jane. Thank you. I actually had no idea. STPs, same time people. Now I can say that to people now. And then other challenges, Patricia says, sometimes conflict between two institutions and organizations get in the way of getting people out. Nice. Interesting. Um, Yusuf and Cindy, would you say some of those as well? Anyone that said other in the chat? Um, so yeah, irrelevant. all of them. I liked, uh, I saw the irrelevant responses. Yes. Yeah, sometimes people have an ax to grind and find it anywhere to share it. So yes, <laughs> understood. Yes. Great. Okay. So let's get to the next questions and I'm going to kind of direct this one at Cindy, but please feel free Yusuf, since I know this is like an overall challenge sometimes, but I know that Cindy, uh, you also really were, um, up against this was, um, how do you navigate communication and public relations strategies with very limited budgets? Um, and then moreover, I'd love for you to give really great examples of successful low cost or organic growth initiatives. I'm curious. Yeah, um, I, I will say we are fortunate here in the city to be very supported as a, a department. I, you know, the we're a city of about 22,000 folks, so we're not a huge city. Um, I, we do have a, a team of four. So I recognize that we are fortunate in many ways on the communication side. But um, yeah, you know, we, we don't have uh, millions and many times even thousands of dollars to throw at communication solutions. So um, using this community engagement platform is uh, one way that we've really um, tried to stretch bandwidth on uh, getting input and feedback where we, like you said, we don't have the ability to go door to door or canvas. Um, we can use some of our communication strategies to direct people. Um, we'd have signage out in public parks. So we'll try, you know, at Yusuf did, I think, very well point out for folks that aren't already in the loop, that aren't already following our social media or aren't on our email list, um, trying to meet them where they are. So putting up signage that will direct them back to those platforms. So if they can't make the community meetings, they're not at all interested in the community meetings, they at least have a way to find more information. 
Um, and then we really lean heavily on our community partner network. So um, we have a good relationship with uh, the school system here. They have a, a team member in all their schools called a parent engagement associate. Um, so we uh, rely on those folks to share with the family network, the school family network. They use Class Dojo here in Maryland. So, um, you know, we tried our best to prepackage that information and make it easy for them to do. So that's, you know, our, our team has the bandwidth there to um, put together a social media blurb or put together a graphic that we can share with the schools. We can share with some of our congregations or our clergy. That's another, um, you know, kind of trusted partner network. If folks aren't interested in connecting with local government or feel distrustful of local government, um, they might hear some of that messaging and the need to engage better from someone that they regularly interact with. Yeah, I want to echo that last point. I think, um, you know, because our office uh, does have a small team and a limited budget, I think we've had a lot, a lot of success with, um, you know, bringing stakeholder groups um, and advocate groups uh, into the lawmaking process early. Um, and, you know, kind of when we're working through policy solutions with the folks that are in the field that are experts, um, I think it helps us amplify our messaging because then, you know, these different community groups are able to then go back um, into their neighborhoods and kind of uh, kind of mirror that messaging and share that messaging um, with uh, with folks in a more intimate way than, uh, say, like local government can, because local government kind of has to cast a bit of a broad net. Um, so, yeah, I, I echo what uh, Cindy was saying that you know, really leveraging those partnerships um, is key. Great, thank you. Um, and then moreover, in terms of any like light touch awareness, um, how have any like light touch projects or maybe non-traditional avenues helped to engage the community more effectively? Um, I know that Cindy, you had like a really great holiday lights project um for that um I don't know if you want to maybe touch upon that I think that was pretty interesting yeah so you know again the sort of meeting people where they are um we do want folks to engage on our bigger meteor projects or you know traffic calming and street work the parks work um but you know if they if they're blindsided to that or not looking at us they definitely will vote to make their house or their neighbor's house win in the holiday lights contest because there's a prize associated with it um, so that, you know, every year we have nominees that come in, we have a photographer go out, take pictures of them. Um, this year was the first year we uploaded that to the uh, Citizen Lab platform and had folks vote on it through that platform. Um, we've done it before as simply as a Google survey, but, um, you know, allowing people to find their way into Citizen Lab through that uh, touch point then meant that they potentially set up an account and or signed up to follow along with other projects that they saw there. So even if they're missing all those other touch points that we were putting out there, if they're missing the signage, the social media, the notes from the teachers, um, they might have got in through that means. So um, we're trying, we do this in a lot of communications, uh, not just through necessarily our communication platform, but trying to find ways that we, you know, people uh, want to follow along. We do this on social media too. There, there can be fun <laughs> in local government. So that when there is a big news, important news to get out, hopefully you already have that audience built in. Great. Yusuf, did you want to add to any of that for any like light touch awareness? Yeah, you know, I think uh, that's how we try to use our um, social media accounts is just to get, you know, to try to tell that story um, of what we're working on to pique people's interests and then give them an action item, whether that's, you know, um, you know, uh, going to this our citizen lab uh, uh, page to participate in um, you know, uh, a, a voting exercise or even pushing them towards uh, a committee hearing uh, where, you know, uh, you know, there, there may be a bill that folks in the, in the general public are, are really interested in. So we want to direct them towards like one option, one way of getting, make, getting their voice heard. So I feel like for us, social media has become a little more passive than our other options. It's something that people can like scroll through and engage with on at their um, kind of at their, uh, on their timeline. Uh, but we always try to pair that with, okay, what's an action you can take um, so that they're, they're not just left with information. They know what to do with it. Yeah. I, I like that. It's kind of going back to meeting them where they are, but also kind of to Cindy's point is like meeting them where maybe they have more interest, right? So maybe like mm -hmm. a kind of 
to your example, the holiday lights project was maybe more fun and exciting for someone. And then that can allow them to snowball to more greater and bigger projects. Um, just a, a quick example as well. I worked with an organization here at Citizen Lab where they used one of their projects for uh, during the pandemic. And they, um, they asked everyone to just like post a photo that they were comfortable with without like their, their mask. Um, and then just to smile. And then they got everyone to engage. And then someone went like, won like a gift card for like uh, the most votes on like the cutest smile. Right. So there's like small, like touch points that you can definitely do for your projects that aren't very crazy, take a lot of work that allow people to start participating, maybe just seamlessly before those bigger projects. Right. So I like that. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so let's get to the next segment, which is building trust. Um, and let's start with our other Zoom poll question, which is how do you perceive the level of trust within your community towards the initiatives undertaken by the local government? So we have here very high, high, medium, low, very low. We'll wait a few seconds just to see what we have said. We to invite the very high person to do the next webinar. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm like, who's that? <laughs> okay, so we have neutral, interesting, okay, low, about 35% of us, um, high, 21%. Um, very low 3% and then very high. Um, I would love, um, for anyone to kind of comment in the chat if they're at neutral. I'm curious, what does that look like? What do you mean by neutral? Um, and then maybe the one that said very high and very low, if you're comfortable, maybe sharing a bit in the chat, um, would love to see that. Okay, so let's get into learning more a little bit about trust and maintaining that trust. So I'd love to kind of get to pick your brain, the both of you. How do you build and maintain trust with the community, especially when deploying maybe new platforms or communication strategies? So I'd love to ask both of you, but I did want to do a little bit of shout out specifically to Yusuf. Um, so when Yusuf first started his um, RAND Settlement Funds project, I think they started in August and I believe September um, around that um, of 2023. Uh, within just like a couple of months, it was so quick, um, they had over 17,000 people engaging. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if that there could be more uh, numbers, but I would love to know uh, from the both of you, but specifically Yusuf as well, is um, how within that like time or maybe even before, how are you building and maintaining trust um, to get people to start, you know, using these platforms to start engaging? I think um, uh, it's something I said earlier, but I think really starting the process uh, by inviting people in to understand like you know, what What are ways that we can get input from you, the public, in ways that work for you? I mean, you know, one thing that the board does really well is schedule committee hearings and public meetings, uh, but the reality is, you know, those are often scheduled during times when people aren't available. Um, uh, and so, you know, something we were hearing from the public is like, you know, surveys work well for us because we can fill those out on our own time. Um, and so, I think starting, you know, kind of having aspects of your process that you can develop in partnership with the public is 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 like a way to start building trust. Um, and then, you know, I think the next step in that is, you know, people will continue to participate if they feel like and they see that their input is is being put to use. Um, you know, so what we tried to do is really make sure that anytime we had um we ask people for input. We also publish results on what that uh, uh, what that phase of our process looked like, so people could see how our decisions getting made. Um, it's really like our way of showing our work. Um, but then the key thing to like building trust is, you know, I think it's really on whoever's ultimately making these decisions to support a virtuous cycle 
by acting on the public's feedback. Um, you know, if you collect all this feedback and you ask people to put in the time to fill out a survey or go through a voting exercise or show up to a committee hearing, um, if you don't then act on what people are, are asking for, um, you know, I think you really undermine your process. So something that we as a, as a board have really committed to is, you know, uh, you know, we want to know directly from people what are their priority challenges, what ideas do they have for solving those issues, um, and then using those answers to guide the decision making. So I think we're at that point right now where we really, through those surveys and voting exercises, identified um, six ideas and problem areas that residents want us to focus on. So now it's really on us to follow through on that. Um, and kind of our next step is, now that we've identified what those six areas are, uh, uh, holding hearings to um, explore those ideas thoroughly for feasibility, for implementation. Uh, we're inviting experts in to talk about how these ideas may work, how they've worked in other cities, um, and just really showing folks that we're doing our homework and taking their recommendations seriously. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I think we are uh, behind St. Louis in that, in that um, uh, we're still working a little bit on building some of the internal communications around that, which I think came up in some of the comments in the poll of making sure that staff who weren't used to having this level of digital engagement who, you know, in the pre-pandemic time would have had a community meeting, would have got feedback at a community meeting and would have moved on to the next step. So um, we have been really working internally with the timeline for this, making sure that in the cycle of the project that there's time to, for, even for our staff to put up the page and then time for the community to get input on the page, time to digest that information, and then to move on to the decision-making process. And as Yusuf said, showing that input from the community was not, you didn't just put it in as a rubber stamp. This was actually something that was included uh, in the decision-making process. Or if it wasn't, this is what, you know, you, the, this was the majority input, this was the minority input, or, you know, this is what the input was, but these are the constraints around the project and this is how uh, we've moved forward. So, um, yeah, I think allowing people to see that their voice was heard is one very important trust building um, piece. Um, Andrea, I, I think language access is the next question, but that is also a big issue mm -hmm. in our community is certainly also a, a language access issue and making sure that people feel like they can have a voice and that their voice will be heard in a language that they're comfortable with. Um, so we've really worked to make sure also that our communications and uh, our platform are included, um, have Spanish language access included. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I add one thing? Yes. One more thing. Yeah, I was just also thinking like, um, just based on that poll question, you know, I think a number of us answered that like, you know, we kind of estimate that uh, public trust is maybe low or neutral. Um, and so, you know, I think, unfortunately, uh, following through seems like a novelty to most people um, mm -hmm. in terms of their relationship with, with, with government. So I think that's kind of the, um, the main thing that folks in our position can do is it's not what people expect. Um, and so I think it's on us to surprise them and show them that, um, you know, we are taking your feedback and this is what it looks like. And I think that can go a long way. I mean, we're at that point right now. So I'll be curious to see what happens in the next, you know, few months as we have, as we get into this next leg of our project. But I think that's, uh, you know, uh, that's something to consider is that it's not something that people are expecting. So, you know, it's important that you do it. <laughs> So I hear a lot of like, not just checking the box for engagement, mm -hmm. but really adding that feedback loop, but not just the feedback loop, but validating the community members and saying, okay, this is what was said. This is the next steps. Um, and then just not also making it go too fast, like having phases in between. So collecting the data, understanding the data, analyzing that data, what are we going to do with that? And then the options going forward, which one's actually feasible. So maybe there was one option that really went really well, but is this even feasible for the organization, right? So really understanding that. Um, great. Um, and then in the chat quickly, I just wanted to uh, read a little bit of what had people had said. So we have Miranda here. They say the neutrality in my area is based on the different types of initiatives and how those initiatives are linked to our two party system. And there were quite a, a bit of upvotes for that one. And then we have Kristen um, and they also said, I think that mixed would have been a better answer for us. 
like that. Overall, I do think there is low trust, but it really depends on who you talk to in the community. Some might have a higher trust based on their interactions with us. Thanks. Um, quickly, I do have one Q&A that I think I would like to ask during this part. Um, so we have someone anonymously asked, government has overcome varying levels of distrust and are sometimes weary about sharing personal information, but we need that information to determine if our engagement was inclusive. Do you ask participants for demographic information or extrapolate that from census data? And then they added a little bit, residents are sometimes weary about sharing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Cindy. No, I, Yusuf, I think you have uh, probably a better hand on uh, comparison against census data. I'll just say in our citizen lab platform, we do ask for demographics, but we make it optional. One thing that is can be a clue for us is we ask um, the ward that the community mm -hmm. uh, member lives in. Where the city here is divided into five wards, and we do have an overlap of census data that we can overlay over those wards, and that will give us a little bit of data that we can maybe better understand where that community member is coming from. Um, but certainly allowing folks to comment anonymously or um, you know, give input without providing that demographic data, we would much rather have the input um, so that we can move forward. The demographic data is sort of icing on the cake that helps us understand a little bit more context in the picture. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. Like, you know, we don't want, uh, you know, we do want people's input and we understand that Sometimes folks are sensitive about that information, so we've made it optional. Um, and then anytime you know we uh, publish the results of a particular you know uh, uh, phase in our process, you know we really try to hold up um, census data so people can can do, do some they have context for you know who is participating in this process. Um, mostly, you know we you know obviously we want the public to see that, um, but. You know, we also want the lawmakers, the folks that are going to be making these decisions, uh, to um, to use that as uh, as information to, to to as a guide when they're thinking about what their next steps are. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I think it, it is tricky, but uh, you know, like Cindy said, I think if you also have, you know, St. Louis is, is is unique in that it is pretty, you know, it is it is it is pretty split north south. Uh, so I think. One of the things that we did, as Cindy mentioned, that uh, uh, that we asked for was, you know, ward information so we could see where are people coming from, and that helped us get a sense for, you know, what are people's priorities on the north side versus, versus the south side. Great, thank you. Okay, so we talked a little bit about language, so I'm going to actually go to the next question, um, all about data. So how do you utilize and communicate desegregated data to ensure your engagement strategies are transparent, inclusive, and tailored to address your community's diverse needs, but also acknowledging and adjusting for any representation gaps? Would it be okay? Like, I, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I could drop our most recent report in the chat yeah for folks to look at because we really did you know kind of in the later pages in the um, report we, we we lay that out you know we, we kind of compare the results we got um, during the voting exercise to census data so people could see you know who turned out uh for this exercise and you know uh was it representative of our our, our city or not i don't know if that's appropriate yeah okay yeah I, I think yeah, yeah i think definitely sharing it this is like the part of this is like sharing best practices, being able to have like that coffee chat style where we can like, you know, inspire others. So thank you so much for sharing that, Yusuf. Um, and what I'll do is I'll make sure is I'll also include it in the follow up because I know this is being recorded. So I'll make sure that I also uh, share this with anyone that is not attending, but is in our recording. So and then, you thank know. you so yeah. yeah, last thing I'll say about that, like alongside just showing people that data, we really tried to make sure that we were talking people through it um, in the report so that we're not just turning over disambiguated data that people have to interpret on their own. Um, you know, that's where uh, relying on skills on your team is important. You know, our policy director here um, in the president's office um, is also, you know, our, you know, our primary data analyst. Um, and so, uh, she spent, you know, uh, a significant amount of time breaking these numbers down and and walking people through the comparison so that uh, they could understand um, what might account for uh, for the differences between 
actual population and then voting participants in a particular phase of our project. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you said that because how often do you get like a data analyst like chart or sheet and you're like, I have no idea how to read this. So not only are you actually being, being transparent, but you're actually walking them through it so that they understand not just like the transparency of the numbers, but like, okay, what's going to happen next? This is in explaining it thoroughly. So thank you, Yusuf. Um, there's lots of hearts on that PDF you just shared. So we really appreciate that. Um, Cindy, did you want to maybe touch quickly upon that as well? Sure. And uh uh, I mentioned earlier, we've worked with some really terrific consultants in this area on particularly some park projects recently, and they also have been able to turn around for us some um, really interesting data analysis like that. Uh, on our end, uh, again, on a capacity side, we haven't really dug deep into data analysis aside what um, the Citizen Lab platform provides for us, but it does allow us to know, um, you know, particularly age range, uh, we can see gender, we can see um, and on the language access side, we get very few comments fully in Spanish, which to me says that, uh, you know, we are trying to reach particularly a monolingual, monolingual speaking population um, in our translation. So um, that is one area of growth. So we've identified for us, you know, what are the groups that probably need a heavier, you know, they're not getting the social media stuff, what, what needs a heavier touch in terms of outreach on future projects. Um, but certainly the packages that the consultants put together for us showing how that data was aggregated, you know, what are the results coming out of it when we put those back up on the platform, that's a really helpful kind of closing the loop uh, cycle for us. Great, thank you so much. Okay, let's get to the next uh, part, which is internal communications and feedback loop. So we've kind of mentioned it a bit, but let's get into it. So let's get into the first question, which is how do you integrate communications throughout your projects and not just a final step? Can you uh, really like share with us the importance of the internal feedback loops? This is this is the thing that I think is our next phase for <laughs> Citizen Lab. Uh, we've been using the platform for uh, two or three-ish years at this point. Um, and as I mentioned, it has been a learning process for the staff outside of our department to make sure it's built into the timeline of their cycles. Um, but the data that we get has been really valuable to them. Whether we get 15 comments or 300 comments, it, the data that we get is more than they would typically get at a public meeting for all the reasons we mentioned previously of, you know, it's inconvenient for time, for childcare, for transportation, et cetera. So they are, they, uh, I do think our staff are realizing they're hearing from a broader population than they have in the past. Um, and so the value of that data is helping them see the value in, in extending maybe their timeline. And I, I know everybody here with governments knows that's complicated in terms of getting approvals on council agendas and you know get, getting your RFPs out there, all that stuff. So it is have having space for this does mean other things in the cycle get blocked off. So um, just working closely with your other staff to help them see that value and help them understand the breakdown of the timeline. Um, I, I say we're getting there. <laughs> we're we're really uh, moving forward and progressing. And the the biggest thing has really been. Um, being able to pull that information for them and show that, again, that the community feels empowered and that we're building trust in the work that they do. Yeah, and for us, I think it's been, you know, we're, I think we're different than, um, you know, uh, we're in a different place than where Cindy is. You know, ours is a little easier to manage just because we have like one project that we're managing through the platform right now as a pilot. Um, and our hope is that, you know, as we can show um, other uh, city departments how effective this tool is uh, bringing more folks on board. Right now, it's really just the legislative branch of government that's using this tool, but we kind of see in the future, you know, uh, making this something that uh, St. Louis citywide could use. Um, and I think that question of uh, how do we communicate internally is going to change a lot uh, if we get to that point. Um, right now, I would say internal communications has been fairly easy because it is a small team um, that's that's using and managing the platform, including the 14 lawmakers that um, that represent the 14 wards in our city. You know, so it is it is a smaller group, so it is easier to to make sure that we're sitting down and having conversations with with each lawmaker, letting them know, giving them a heads up on where we are in the process, what next, what the next step is, um, and that way they can communicate effectively with effectively with their constituents. Um, so we're at a scale where, you know, it's not 
cumbersome to set up, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings to talk through these things. Um, you know, I know meetings can sometimes seem like uh, not the best use of time, but we also try to make sure that like we keep our meetings to 15 to 30 minutes, you know, we don't need a whole lot of time to, to break things down and answer questions, but we just want to make sure that we make that time for people um, uh, at the Board of Aldermen. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your advice and insight. Um, just to be mindful of time, we're going to start uh, a bit of a conclusion here. But one more question just to ask both of you quickly is um, based on, you know, all the experiences you've had, what advice would you give to everyone here um, in this webinar today um, looking to improve their community engagement and communication strategies? So one quick word of advice to end it off. They start small, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. <laughs> if you have a low hanging fruit project or you have a project where this would be a natural fit or something simple like the holiday lights, you know, something lighthearted that, you know, wouldn't, um, you know, have a, a big, you wouldn't have to involve a lot of other departments or have a big impact, um, start there and get your experience and your process in place so that uh, you are better equipped than when you go to the other departments to understand what you need. Um, and what, again, timelines, what all, what all those pieces are. Yeah. And, and I think for me, it's like, be really clear about what, um, what you're asking folks for and how that information is going to be used. That way you don't set up, you don't by accident, um, you know, fail to meet expectations once you get into those like key decision-making parts of your process. So, um, you know, I think show your work. I know that sounds really simple, but just showing people from start to finish what you're doing, I think is really important. Um, that way no one feels misled or um, isn't in the loop. Um, that would be my advice. Great, thank you. So we heard from Cindy and Yusuf, and now we'd like to hear from you. So let's get to the next slide as we're just about to end. So we'd love to hear from you. What's a communications challenge you've had in your community and how have you solved it? So feel free to add in the chat, et cetera. Just love to hear some inspiration of current challenges you've been able to overcome or maybe even lower the barriers too. 